hello there good morning hope uh, you guys are doing good uh, so for today's lecture we will be discussing uh, the methods of gaining space and the various methods and techniques used in arch expansion as for the learning outcomes you should be in a position to outline the methods of gaining space outline the indications and contraindications of methods of gaining space and also identify the need of expansion in orthodontics. So coming to the introduction to uh, today's topic, so what is the need for creating space? Uh, any uh, kind of uh, mild relationship which exists within the teeth, any kind of crowding, retraction, or intrusion, leveling curve of P, derotation of anterior teeth or correction of the molar relationships will all require additional space. So, in an attempt to move teeth into their future ideal locations, you have to create space. So, that's what we're going to discuss today uh, and we will go into the methods of uh, gaining space in the coming slides. So what are the different methods used in gaining space? So you can see here I've enlisted seven methods. Uh, they are proximal stripping or uh, interproximal reduction, expansion of the dental arches, extraction of select teeth, distalization of canines and molars, uprighting of molars, derotation of posterior teeth, and also proclination of anterior teeth. So these are all the different methods. Uh, you can use uh, to gain space uh, so that, uh, that the teeth are uh, placed ideally within the dental arches and in better uh, positions uh, intra arch as well. Uh, we shall start with uh, proximal stripping or uh, interproximal reduction. So this is a method by which the proximal surfaces of the tooth are stripped or sliced to reduce the mesiodistal width of the tooth. So you can see uh, it pretty well in the images and in the representational uh, tooth image uh, on your screens. So basically uh, the technique will involve a reduction of the mesial and distal surfaces of the individual teeth whereby creating the uh, space between them and uh, the space which you've created will help in the treatment of uh, borderline cases by non-extraction approach and also will enable you to uh, achieve a more favorable overjet and overbite. Uh, by creating this uh, uh, space, uh, the contact area is broadened so the teeth fit better and you will have uh, stable results. Uh, also, if you notice some gingival recession, uh, this can be improved as well. So let's look at the indications and contraindications for performing proximal stripping. So when it comes to indications, if you see there is mild Bolton's tooth material excess of around 3 to 5 millimeters or uh, when you perform a caries analysis and you find that there is around uh, less than 2.5 millimeters of uh, space needed, uh, you can uh, use this technique. Uh, you can also use this technique as an aid in retention. As I previously mentioned, the teeth will fit better because of the broadened contact areas and they can... Uh, uh, occupy a uh, uh, more uh, uh, stable position uh, and also it will help you in uh, maintaining uh, uh, good oral hygiene. Uh, if you want to maintain class 1 canine and molar relationships, you can perform this. If uh, there is class 1 arch length discrepancies with orthognathic profiles, that's uh, a, a good candidate for proximal stripping as well and uh, any minor class 2 dental malocclusions uh, seen in non-growing patients, you can use this technique again. Uh, however, uh, there are a few contraindications to this. Uh, if uh, you're doing it in uh, young patients, you'll have to be mindful of the, uh, uh, the larger pulp chamber. So any accidental uh, uh, exposure uh, can lead to pulpal uh, 
pathology so you'll have to be mindful of that and how much reduction you do uh, or at times you might consider not doing it and use other uh, techniques for gaining space uh, if the patient has very high caries index then again you will uh, have to think twice before uh, cutting the medial and uh, distal surfaces uh, because uh, when a proximal stripping is performed the area will be rendered rough and this increased uh, susceptibility for caries for enlargement and so on uh, if the patient is known to uh, maintain very poor oral hygiene that's also a contraindication and if uh, an individual has enamel hyperplasia you cannot perform uh, proximal stripping on such individual. So that was IPR. So more uh, details on IPR, you will find it in your uh, lecture notes. Uh, I don't want to extend uh, uh, the slide uh, duration for a very long time. Uh, so you will have to go through your uh, lecture notes uh, to get more insight into uh, the different uh, methods used as well. I'm not covering it here in the lecture. Uh, so the next uh, method used is extraction. So when uh, a, a tooth or teeth are extracted as a procedure to support treatment, it's called therapeutic extraction. Uh, so usually the teeth which you're going to uh, extract will be the premolars. So they will bear the brunt of uh, extraction. And uh, there is one advantage because uh, extracting premolars, uh, you're able to move uh, the posterior teeth forward and also move the anterior teeth backwards uh, because of their uh, centrally uh, uh, located uh, positions. And uh, you can extract molars, incisors, canines under various uh, circumstances depending on the individual uh, treatment and patient needs uh, ideally arch length and tooth material should be in harmony with each other uh, before you consider uh, uh, which tooth to extract and this will guide you in uh, which particular tooth to extract as well uh, so if you find an arch length discrepancy of less than four millimeters extraction is rarely indicated uh, however if the discrepancy is 5 to 10 millimeters so you can treat um, either uh, with extraction or uh, non-extraction uh, approach and if uh, the arch length discrepancy is over 10 millimeters or uh, it's beyond that uh, extraction is definitely required so now coming to the third uh, method used, which is uh, called uh, distalization of molars. So moving the teeth posteriorly, okay, moving the molar teeth posteriorly using fixed or orthopedic appliances is what is known as distalization of molars. So the best time to perform this would be before the eruption of second permanent molars. Um, it's logical because if uh, the second permanent molars are already erupted, it uh, you will need more force and it becomes, uh, it resists any backward uh, movement of uh, the, uh, the molars. So before uh, second molars are uh, uh, seen in the arch, if you were to commence utilization, it will have a better uh, prognosis. And um, the advantages would be you can avoid extraction and also uh, the prevent arch from collapsing. Uh, what are the indications? Uh, it will be based on the axial inclination. Uh, if there are uh, mesially angulated upper molars, you can definitely uh, distalize them. Uh, uh, individuals with average or hypodivergent growth pattern are candidates for uh, distalization as well. And uh, uh, late mixed dentition with mild crowding of anteriors, uh, you can subject them for distalization. Uh, however, uh, the contraindication to this uh, method will be a uh, high mandibular plane angle. Uh, yeah, that's with the uh, distalization. So how do you choose the best candidate for this approach? So uh, case selection becomes an important uh, thing here. So if you see a normal or uh, near normal maxillary arch, 
you can go ahead. Uh, however, the ideal time will be late mixed dentition. That's because there is still a bit of uh, growth remaining in the maxillary tuberosity area and hence uh, the uh, arch will adapt uh, to the uh, newly uh, moved uh, position of uh, molars. Uh, usually this is in the age group of uh, 14 to 15 years in females and 16 to 17 years in uh, males. Uh, so if the molars are placed in a normal buccolingual position, you can do uh, distillation. Uh, if the third molars are absent or uh, stacking of upper molars, you will have to uh, find another uh, alternative. Uh, it also forms a contraindication for this. Uh, if uh, they have a well-developed nose and chin and also if they have an orthognathic uh, profile, you can definitely go ahead. And if there is mild to moderate space discrepancy, it will definitely uh, help in such patients or individuals. So what is uh, the classification of uh, this method? There are several classifications uh, based on the location of appliance. It's classified into extraoral and intraoral. Uh, position of the appliance in the mouth, buccal or palatal. The type of movement, hipping or bodily movement. Compliance, maximum compliance, minimum or no compliance required. Type of appliance will be fixed or removable and uh, the arches involved, it's whether intra-arch or inter-arch. So here you can see some of the appliances used. So it's been divided into extra-oral and intra-oral. So I want you to take a moment and uh, remember as many as possible. Uh, not all, but a few would definitely help you to have an idea of uh, whether they are extraoral or intraoral appliances. So another method of uh, distillation is using uh, mini implants. Here uh, it is uh, more efficient and faster because the reciprocal forces are not transmitted to other teeth, but they can be concentrated at that particular tooth or teeth which are being distillized and also uh, they provide true anchorage that there is no movement of uh, the anchor teeth as in a conventional anchorage. Uh, they can be indirect anchorage or direct anchorage and they come in various dimensions from 6 to 10 millimeters and can be used in any part of the mouth. It's as such a very efficient uh, process as the molar movement depends on the direction of the force which is in relation to the center of resistance of the molar and magnitude of force. So when you control these, you have an efficient crystallization of molars. So the next uh, technique uh, or method you can follow is uh, the uprighting of molars. So as you can see in the image, if the molar was measly tipped and you were able to uh, upright it, so you automatically you gained enough space to uh, retract the rest of the teeth into that space or uh, fit uh, a prosthesis or an implant if the tooth is lost or you know you can you can work your way through that space so however uh, if there is a premature loss of second deciduous molar or extraction of premolar uh, that's the resultant uh, effect which you see in the image so uprighting of these teeth will help you in gaining space uh, and these are done using molar uprighting springs. Uh, now coming to the next uh, method uh, which is the derotation of posterior teeth. Here uh, correction of rotated teeth provides extra space within the arch uh, and this is achieved either through fixed appliances or appliances with springs and elastics. So derotation of posterior teeth, however, will take more time because of uh, the, the number of uh, roots. And uh, however, the, if you derotate posterior teeth, space is gained 
uh, whereas for derotation of anterior teeth, space is required. So before you attempt to derotate uh, a rotated anterior tooth, you have to understand that you have to create enough space for that particular tooth to be derotated into its ideal position. Next and uh, the last uh, method uh, of gaining space is proclamation of anterior teeth. It's indicated when teeth are retroclined and uh, in individuals where the soft tissue profile is unaffected and uh, this can be easily achieved through fixed appliances. So the next method and the last method we will be discussing is the expansion. How do you expand a dental arch? I think that was the question Emerson in 1860 uh, answered for us. So he suggested rapid maximally expansion and hence he's known as the father of expansion appliances. And it was also Walter Coffin in 1837 who designed uh, Coffin Spring uh, to aid uh, expansion of the maximally arches. So um, RME can be slow, semi-rapid or rapid. It can be achieved through removal or fixed. Uh, fixed can be both tooth borne or tooth and tissue borne and it can be banded or bonded. So what are the diagnostic aids for performing a RME? You will have to have uh, good study models, detailed uh, clinical history and also you will need to equip yourself with uh, radiographs, OPG, posterior anterior and maxillary occlusal. Here you will see some of the indications for performing uh, an RME. Uh, so they are grouped as dental and uh, medical. Uh, under dental you will see that there is if there is posterior cross fight, unilateral or bilateral with maxillary deficiencies. Uh, expansion is indicated. Uh, individuals with class 3 malocclusion, both gentle and skeletal, with associated cross bite. Uh, individuals exhibiting uh, cleft lip and or palate with collapsed maxillary arch, it's definitely uh, indicated. And also in individuals with mild tooth material to arch length discrepancies. So uh, when uh, the arches are expanded, there's enough. Uh, space to accommodate teeth better. Um, however, uh, the medical indications will be if uh, he or she exhibits poor nasal airway, septal deformities, recurrent nasal or sinus infections, allergic rhinitis and uh, asthma. So you'll have to get a proper uh, medical history before you actually decide on what to do and how to handle the case. So what are some of the contraindications? So if there is a single tooth cross bite, if uh, the patients are uncooperative, if uh, there is skeletal asymmetry of the maxilla or the mandible, if uh, vertical growers with steep mandibular plane angle, if there is anterior open bite, and if the individuals have periodontally challenged dentition, uh, expansion is contraindicated. So uh, what are the effects of RME? So you can uh, divide uh, the effects of RME on uh, several structures. Uh, basically, it's on the maxillary skeletal base, maxillary anterior teeth, maxillary posterior teeth, on the mandible, on the alveolar bone, on the adjacent cranial bones and the sutures, and finally the nasal cavity. So we'll go into uh, a little uh, details on each of these. So, um, the effects of RME on maxillary skeletal base. So, you can see on the image uh, how uh, there is a triangular space opening up or a fan shaped opening of the mid palatal suture, uh, wherein the maximum opening is at the maxillary incisor region, which uh, diminishes posteriorly. Uh, if you were to see it in the superior inferior direction, you can see that the maximum opening is seen at the oral cavity rather than at the nasal cavity. So that will give you an understanding of how 
uh, the maxillary structures respond to expansion. Uh, amount of expansion achieved will be equivalent to uh, 10 millimeters and the rate of expansion is uh, around 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters per day, which is not easily discernible initially, but over a period of time, you can definitely start appreciating that uh, there is separation of maxillary arches. Uh, how about the effects of RME on maxillary anterior teeth? The easiest sign here would be the development of midline diastema between the two central incisors. As you can see on the image uh, where the arrows are pointing, uh, at the moment there is a separation of incisors in the midline. A midline diastema is clinically evident and then uh, it's an uh, indication that uh, the maxillary arches are expanding. Um, the effects on uh, maxillary posterior teeth uh, the teeth will uh, start tipping buckly and there might be some amount of extrusion as well uh, once the arches start separating. Uh, however, uh, the effects of the mandible, uh, there will be some amount of downward and backward rotation of the mandible Sorry, as a result of extrusion of the maxillary posterior teeth. All right. So when it comes to the effects on the alveolar bone, uh, there will be slight amount of uh, bending of the buccal plates owing to the compression of the periodontal fibers and also due to the resilient nature of the bone. So the bone bends slightly buccally. Um, uh, how about the adjacent cranial bones and sutures? They are known to displace the parietal and occipital bones. Uh, and finally, the effects on nasal cavity. Uh, separation of the outer walls of the nasal cavity can lead to an increased intranasal space. So how do you perform uh, RME? Uh, so you can use some removable appliances. Uh, however, uh, they are known to be less reliable and have uh, questionable uh, uh, skeletal expansion possible through the use of them. Uh, however, they produce some effect uh, during uh, deciduous or early mixed stages only. Uh, the appliance here will consist of an acrylic uh, plate which is split at the midline with a midline screw with retentive clasps on the posterior teeth or uh, at times with the labial bone, the anterior teeth. Uh, however, uh, uh, with these um, appliances, the disadvantages are uh, patient uh, cooperation and also difficulty in retaining the plate in the mouth. You can use several fixed appliances for uh, gaining space through expansion um, because they are more uh, reliable and produce a more uh, consistent skeletal effect. So what are some of the common types? So the first one we'll be discussing is uh, Judge Wheeler uh, type expander. Here, uh, uh, the, the, the expansion uh, screw is uh, in the midline, uh, which uh, has two acrylic uh, you know, plates on either side, and uh, the appliance is secured um, through premolar bands and molar bands. Um, and also, the wire tags will extend onto the acrylic plate so that there is enough uh, stability for the appliance. Uh, the next type is known as has type expander. Here there are uh, lingual support wires on either side of the midline um, uh, with a uh, acrylic plate and expansion crew in the in the midline. So activating this will push the lingual wires against the posterior teeth resulting in expansion. The next appliance is uh, Isaacson type expander. Here, instead of uh, an acrylic plate, it's replaced by an uh, expansion screw and uh, there are buccal and palatal metal flanges. So activating the screw will uh, push uh, the buccal and palatal metal flanges uh, outwards, resulting in expansion. And uh, the, the other uh, uh, kind is uh, hyrax. 
So here uh, you can see uh, the Hyrex appliance fitted in the patient's mouth, uh, wherein there is a screw in the midline in the mid palatal region, and also it's secured with uh, premolar band and a molar band. So you can also see the direction in which the screw has to be activated for uh, uh, any kind of uh, a positive expansion to take place. We also have uh, bonded appliances, which cover a variable number of teeth, and they'll consist of a cast cap splint made of either uh, copper or silver and uh, acrylic splints. So here you can see the teeth are uh, enclosed within an acrylic splint, and there is an expander in the mid-palatal region. So those were some of the expanders you've uh, seen which are uh, commonly used in uh, orthodontics uh, however there are certain guidelines you'll have to follow uh, in order to understand uh, um, when to stop and uh, what to look for when you're using these uh, expanders so the general guidelines are uh, 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 there to assist us in understanding these so you will stop expansion when the maxillary palatal cusps and the mandibular buccal cusps are at the same level okay if the maxillary palatal cusp is uh, above uh, the buccal cusp of the mandibular teeth that's an indication to stop expansion and uh, the screw thread should also uh, be checked uh, in each appointment uh, to look for uh, remaining uh, thread. Uh, if you don't do this and if you go on expanding, there'll be a point of time wherein uh, the screw is no longer available and then uh, the screw can disengage and the appliance halves will be free to move, okay? Uh, so uh, to prevent this, you can uh, place some acrylic to secure the screw. Uh, once you've done that, you can use the same appliance as a retainer and retain the teeth in that position for three to six months uh, for uh, healing of the uh, transeptal fibers. Uh, so um, you can also use um, uh, hollies or a transpalatal arch uh, as a retentive uh, aid once uh, the uh, uh, required amount of expansion is achieved. So here you can uh, see an expansion uh, screw and the key. Uh, it basically consists of an oblong body divided into two halves which can move in opposite directions. Uh, so here if you turn the key uh, 90 degrees, it will uh, cause a linear movement of 0.18 millimeters. So the activation schedule uh, for uh, these uh, uh, expanders is important for you to understand and remember. So I would encourage you to pay some uh, attention now. So there are two um, uh, methods or techniques uh, proposed. One was by Tim's and the other one is by uh, Zimmering and Isaacson. Sim, uh, Tim's uh, recommends uh, a 90 degree rotation both morning and evening for uh, uh, individuals up to 15 years of age if they are beyond 15 years then you will use 45 degree rotation four times a day and uh, Zimmering and Isaacson divided uh, the individuals into two groups growing and non-growing in a growing group you will have to uh, turn it twice a day, four to five days, then one turn per day till the desired expansion is achieved. And for the non-growing group, two turns a day for two days, then one turn per day for five to seven days, followed by turns on alternate days till desired expansion is achieved. So depending on uh, what age group you are uh, treating and what kind of schedule you want to follow, you'll have to remember and uh, follow it precisely so that uh, whatever uh, expansion you desire will be achieved. 
Uh, there's also a surgical uh, method of uh, gaining uh, space, uh, I mean, uh, of uh, creating this expansion. So it's called surgically assisted uh, rapid parietal expansion or rapid maxillary expansion. So uh, when do you subject a patient or an individual to surgery? It depends on the resistance to separation in the maxilla due to the mid palatal synostosis, mid palatal interlocking and circummaxillary rigidity. So age becomes a factor. So you have to assess that. Uh, however, uh, it is uh, observed that 5% of the suture ossification can be overcome by RME. So if the ossification and the age group is appropriate, then you might attempt RME. And if it fails, then you can uh, subject the individual to a surgical approach. Uh, patients or individuals uh, aged 25 years and above uh, you'll have to uh, subject them to a surgery and one of the uh, techniques of surgery used is uh, tennis virus technique more details on that in your lecture notes uh, as there is a rapid maxillary expansion there's an opposite to it which is uh, slow expansion so this is also a kind of expansion wherein uh, you can increase the arch width by movement of a few teeth uh, it's termed uh, dentoalveolar expansion uh, although you will notice some amount of skeletal expansion occurring and the rate of expansion here uh, in slow expansion is around 0.5 to 1 millimeters per week. Uh, however, there are quite many differences between rapid maxillary expansion and slow expansion. So I encourage you to refer to that uh, particular chapter uh, uh, in section 7 um, for more details on that. Here we will discuss a few appliances used in uh, slow expansion. Uh, the first one is coffin spring developed by Walter Coffin. Uh, it is a removable appliance capable of uh, slowed into alveolar expansion. Uh, the appliance uh, consists of an omega shaped wire of 1.25 mm thickness placed in the mid palatal region. It's very clearly evident on the image. So the free ends of the omega wire are embedded in the acrylic covering the slopes of the palate. Okay and also the expansion or uh, uh, how do you uh, activate this uh, appliance you can pull the two sides apart manually or you can use a three pong uh, pliers to separate the uh, two uh, halves of the acrylic plate And the next one uh, we will discuss is called W arch. Uh, it's used to correct bilateral constriction in primary dentition so uh, that it accelerates the rate of normal expansion of the mid palatal suture in a young child. Uh, the appliance uh, delivers proper force levels when open three to four millimeters wider than passive width. Uh, so uh, it's easy to activate these uh, uh, appliances as well just by pulling them apart or using manual force. Uh, the next appliance is quite helix. Uh, this is also one of the commonly used uh, appliances for slow expansion. So what are some of the indications for using a quad helix? So any kind of cross bite uh, in the upper arch which needs uh, widening, you can use quad helix. Cases needing mild expansion in the mixed permanent dentition, cases of class two in which upper arch needs to be widened or upper molars rotated distally. Uh, class 3 conditions in which upper arch needs to be widened or advanced with class 3 elastics. And the last indication is any patient with uh, cleft palate condition, either unilateral or bilateral. You can definitely use quad helix to treat such conditions. So how do you activate a quad helix? Uh, here you can use a pre-activated um, helix which is stretched before placement uh, or cementation 
or once it is cemented you can use a three prong applier to activate the appliance so we've come to the the last but one slide mm, so so far you've uh, have you've had a brief uh, understanding of uh, various uh, methods and techniques used for uh, uh, gaining space and techniques used in uh, arch expansion uh, so with that we are going to wind up today's lecture uh, hope you've had uh, a clear understanding uh, for more detailed uh, understanding you will have to refer um, Section 7, as I told you uh, in the textbook of orthodontics, for the differences between rapid and uh, slow expansion. You will also have to refer to your uh, uh, lecture notes for uh, understanding the growth and development behind it, the various classifications behind uh, all the methods we've used, how to construct the appliances, and uh, what are the indications and contraindications of these appliances. So I don't want to uh, burden you uh, a lot uh, with these uh, explanations in this uh, uh, lecture. I want you to have a brief understanding. Once you have this brief understanding, you can definitely go back, refer, and uh, you know, go into a little more reasoning by yourself. So I want you, uh, your participation there. Um, however, if you come across any difficulties you're always free to reach out to me okay with that uh, we're going to end today's lecture thank you for listening